everybody. Welcome to the Banyan Books podcast. My name is Ross McKeechee. And today we are joined by our honored guest, Gary Zukov. Before I get into Gary's formal introduction, I'd like to make a few Banyan announcements. First, acknowledging that although we have people joining us from all different parts of the world, the physical location of Banyan Books and Sound in Vancouver's Kitsilano is on the traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Banyan Books and Sound is in its 50th year of business as an independent bookstore. Just acknowledging that and thanking everybody in the Banyan Books community for supporting us for so long. Of course, all of Mr. Zukov's books are available on our website, www.banyan.com. That's B A N Y E N.com. Or you can purchase his books in store, which is uh, at 4th and Dunbar in Kitsilano. We're open 11 to 7, seven days a week. Okay, our guest today, Mr. Gary Zukov, is a master teacher and an eloquent author of four consecutive New York Times bestsellers. He has appeared 36 times on the Oprah Winfrey Show. Gary grew up in Kansas, graduated from Harvard University, was a US Army Special Forces Green Beret officer with Vietnam service before writing his first book, The Dancing Wu Li Masters, an overview of the new physics that was in 1979. That book was a New York Times bestseller and won the American Book Award for science. In 1993, Mr. Zukov met his spiritual partner, Linda Francis, and together they co-founded the Seed of the Soul Institute in 1998. They've also authored a number of books together, two of which have been New York Times bestsellers. Our honored, our honored guest has won many awards, including the World Business Academy Pathfinder Award for his contribution to the ongoing evolution of knowledge and consciousness within the global business community, and the Einstein Award from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine for his contributions to the psychosocial growth of humanity. Gary's book, The Seed of the Soul, was published in 1989. It captured the imagination of millions, becoming the New York Times number one bestseller 31 times and remaining on the New York Times bestseller list for three years. His books have been published in 30 languages. Today, he is here with us discussing his brand new book, which is coming out June 22nd. It's called Universal Human creating authentic power and the new consciousness. Universal Human is about a new era of human evolution, offering a vision of what a world based on love could be. It offers an invitation to begin bringing such a world into being now. We were honored that Mr. Zukov accepted our invitation to speak with Banyan Books. So let us all welcome our honored guest, Mr. Gary Zukov. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome, Ross. It's a, it's a real joy to be here. And it's a real joy to be in the Banyan, commu Banyan book community. Um, independent bookstores have always been a love of mine. And I'm so happy that Banyan is here and healthy and has you and, and all of us in support of it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure everyone here today and that will listen to this podcast will be really excited that you've joined us. And I, I want to mention also, please, Gary mentioned to me before the interview started that they're updating his, his website. Um, and his website is seatofthesoul.com. So if you go there today, you'll see the old version, but soon the, the most updated version will be there. And it's an exciting uh, new venture. They're going to be reaching out with some new offerings to people, which we'll get into a little bit later. So if I can ask you first, we're, the basis of your, of your new book, Universal Human, is that 
we are at an unprecedented time in terms of the transformation of human consciousness that is happening. <clears throat> Can you just speak to the, the landscape that we're all living in right now and, and what this emergence of a new human consciousness looks like? Oh, it's an amazing landscape. And uh, I, I want to say that I uh, don't expect you or any of our uh, viewers to accept what I say is true or to believe it just because I say it. Uh, I'd also suggest to you and to any of our viewers that you not do that to anyone. Uh, that uh, especially if they have a microphone or a pulpit or a television show or a radio show or a lot of followers online. Take it into yourself. Experiment with what you resonate to. And then if it works for you, experiment with it some more. And if it doesn't, throw it away. Don't try to wear, wear a shoe that pinches. So in my experience, the landscape that we're in is it's utterly amazing. An old consciousness has died and it's, it, it's carryover, it's inertia, is everywhere, everywhere. And a new consciousness has been born. And this new consciousness is touching hundreds of millions of people. And within a few generations, everyone will have this new consciousness. So we are in this remarkable time. Never before has anything like this occurred. First of all, evolution of human consciousness has been a pretty slow affair. And it's been coupled with the evolution of physicality. And it's gone on for 300,000 or maybe 2.5 million years, depending upon where you start counting. But the new consciousness is coming into being with startling velocity. It's exploding. It's, it's occurring faster than a heartbeat faster than an eye blink from the perspective of our previous evolutionary time scale. And here we are with all of us who are listening to this. And by the way, if you're listening to this, if you're listening to Ross and me and buying your books at Banyan, you are in the new consciousness or the new consciousness has touched you. That doesn't mean that you can't buy books at Banyan about the market and fashion and sports and whatever else is of interest to you, I, I presume. But this uh, series that Jacob has put together and has put together for a long time reflects the deeper interest and the deeper goals and the deeper communion of the Banyan bookstore community. And that is consciousness, love, how to live a life of contribution, how to recognize what is happening around you from a larger perspective that is now becoming available to us. So that, from my experience, is the time we're in. So I can give you a little more detail. I can give you a before and after picture, for example. Before this transformation occurred, and the transformation is still occurring, but the new consciousness is dead. Make no mistake about it. It's like a, it's like a huge steam locomotive thundering down the track. And it, in its day, it was awesome. It was the symbol of everything good and progressive. And imagine that this huge, powerful, brutish locomotive is now running out of fuel. And then it's run out of fuel. And it begins to slow. But it doesn't just come to a halt. It slows because of its inertia. And, eventually, and, and the passengers begin to notice this deceleration. And they talk about it. And they, make, and they speculate, why is it happening? We must be running out of fuel. But they don't know that no more is available. And then the engine eventually comes to a standstill. And then the passengers have no option but to get off the train and look for a new way to continue their journey. That's what's happening to all of us now. The fuel of this old locomotive 
the old, the world that the old consciousness built was an old understanding of power as the ability to manipulate and control. And that understanding is obsolete. And it's more than obsolete. It's not just out of style. It's become toxic. It used to be our good medicine. It's how we evolved. Now it's poison. It produces only violence and destruction. So when you're pursuing external power, when you're attempting to manipulate or control the world, including other people, you are producing only violence and destruction. And try this out yourself. If you want to con if you want to convince somebody that your way of looking at the world is the best way or the only way or at least better than their way, keep pushing it. Keep moving on that road and you'll find yourself creating distance from that other person. So that's the before. And by the way, the world that we've inherited from this old consciousness is all around us. The old consciousness is limited to the five senses and what we can see and hear and taste and touch and smell. The new consciousness adds another dimension to that consciousness. In fact, envelops it entirely. You don't stop seeing things with your eyes or hearing them with your ears or feeling the pain if you get your finger caught in a door. But there's more to everything that you experience. It's as though you're watching a black and white movie slowly turning into color as you're watching it. And your experiences are deepening and expanding. For example, so we'll call this new consciousness and your new perception multisensory. I'm saying that because the old consciousness of the five senses was a single system and its object of detection was physical reality. Now we have another sensory system. We are multi-sensory. What's it feel like? I love sharing these things because I want to tell you what my book is about. And especially I want to tell you about how it can support you and what it might mean in your life and how it's relevant, as well as this larger context. So, uh, are you multi-sensory? Have you ever had the thought that you're, or the sense that you're more than a mind and a body? That's a multi-sensory perception. Have you ever had the sense that maybe there's a part of you that lives longer than you, that existed before you were born and that will exist after you die? That's a multi-sensory perception. Have you ever had the thought that the world around you is not just random and you can stop praying for good luck or bad luck because there's more to it than that? There's something more to it. Maybe it's symbolic in some way or it, it has the ability to teach you and not teach you about it, but teach you about you. That's a multi-sensory perception. Have you ever, has it ever occurred to you or have you ever sensed that maybe the universe isn't cold and merciless and uh, random and inert, which is the scientific way of saying dead? Have you ever had the thought that, that maybe the universe is uh, compassionate and wise and maybe even that it's alive? If so, these are all multi-sensory perceptions. It's as though we've been children playing in a yard, and the yard has a fence around it, a backyard. And the fence is there to restrict our experiences to those which are appropriate to our level of learning. Well, the five senses have been our fence. And now we're going beyond the fence. That's the expansion of human consciousness, the transformation of human consciousness. And here's the thing. It's not just a transformation of what's in human consciousness. 
It's the transformation of human consciousness itself. I'm not speaking to you now about changes in what you experience. I'm talking about a change in what you can experience. And this is what's never happened before. So what does that mean for your life? Well, um, do you ever have experiences in your life that you wish weren't there? How about anger? How about jealousy? Oh, that is such a painful experience. How about inferiority? Like when you feel that everyone is more and better than you. And you need to please. There's a part of you that needs to please other people to see the smile. What about feelings of superiority and entitlement? I know that one. I've lived in that for a long time. These are all experiences that separate you from others. You can't connect with them. You can't be intimate with them. How can you be intimate with someone who's angry? I was angry and entitled for most of my life. And I, and I knew it, of course. I knew it. I would even, I even, it was part of my identity. I would tell people, yeah, I'm angry. I've been angry all the time. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> so, and I did, it wasn't until later I discovered that I was pushing people away by the scores. They didn't want to be intimate with me. They didn't want to share. They wouldn't be vulnerable. They wouldn't be real. That doesn't mean I didn't have a lot of people in my life, but it wasn't until a little later I noticed that they were all like me. <laughs> they all felt superior, arrogant, intellectual, and that was our, that was my life. That was their life. Because there's so many things we can see now that we're becoming multisensory. We can see dynamics, the law of attraction, for example. That doesn't mean that you really think about a Ferrari all day long and sooner or later it's going to occur in your life. It's simpler than that. By the way, that was a mistaken belief. That isn't the law of attraction. The law of attraction is simply that energy attracts like energy. So if you're angry, arrogant, superior, judging everyone like I was, then you draw to yourself people who reflect you, who are like you, and you think the whole world's like that. And this is a good thing to know because as you become a loving person, you begin to attract loving people. And you look around and you live in a loving world and you say, this is the way the world really is. It's loving. Five sensory people say, I'll believe it when I see it. Multi-sensory humans know, I'll see it when I believe it. This is just one of the myriad changes in our lives that are happening now. Instead of powers, the ability to manipulate or and control, we have a new understanding of power. We sense it. It's the alignment of our personality with our soul. Now, what does that mean? The intentions of your soul are harmony, cooperation, sharing, and reverence for life. And as you align yourself with those things, you develop a new kind of power a power to be with people and not be tossed like a cork on the ocean by your emotions, a power to see others as souls, a power to see how deep the goodness runs in them and how deep the cruelty and brutality runs in them and recognize that they, like you, are a student in the earth school now exploring all of this so that you can begin to give the gifts that you were born to give. And that's where your fulfillment and joy come into the picture. 
That's what creating authentic power does for you. So this is some of the new terrain. These are the broad picture, brush strokes of the new landscape. So Ross, I've talked a long time. What, what can I answer for you or elaborate? Thank you. That, that beautifully painted a portrait of the landscape. Um, yeah, now we can get into some of the finer points. And I think one of them, you spoke to the intentions of the soul, harmony, cooperation, sharing and reverence for life and that authentic power, which is really the key focus in the book is how do we create authentic power, which you define as alignment of the personality with the soul. But then we run into troubles, the things that pull us away from that. So I'm wondering, you talk about cha uh, challenging the frightened parts of our personality and making this choice moment to moment between love and fear. So in practice, as we're embracing this shift in our own consciousness as part of this collective shift, how do we in practice challenge these frightened parts of our personality in order to move more towards the qualities of the soul and love? Well, that takes us right to the heart of it. You can't embrace authentic power. You have to create it. And just the fact that you're saying a frightened part of my personality, that is already a multi-sensory perception. Because when we were five sensory, we looked at ourselves as a, we looked at a personality as, as a, like a monolithic structure. And sometimes it's angry, sometimes it's jealous, sometimes it's happy, sometimes it's joyful, sometimes it's depressed. But as we become multisensory, we see that our personalities are like mandalas. They have many different parts. And we can begin to distinguish between them. And as we do that, we can realize this part hurts. This part is destructive. I'm not going to act on it. And this part feels good. This part is constructive. I'm going to act on that. Well, that's nice, but how do you do it? In other words, you cannot control what emotion you're going to be feeling next, but you can decide what you're going to do then. So saying, I'm going to embrace love, is that, well, yeah, you can, but then what happens when you become angry and your best friend betrays you? And you say, <laughs> not, but not for him, no way for him. I hope he rots in hell. That's, does that sound abrasive? Look inside yourself and you'll see parts of your personality that think and feel these ways. Uh, you'll find parts of your personality as you create authentic power that are so appreciative so caring, so loving, so grateful. And you'll see them as parts of your personality along with parts that are suicidal, homicidal, genocidal, uncaring, exploitive. All of that is the richness you are. Why do you have these different parts? The fear-based parts of your personality that we've been describing is parts that you experience when you're angry, jealous, jealous vengeful, resentful, enraged, depressed, manic, can't stop obsessing about your work, about sex, about a car or something, something that you want to buy that you've got to own or you're obsessive, or you're addicted to smoking, drinking, drugs, alcohol, gambling, masturbating, pornography, whatever it is, it seems to have you and you can't stop doing it. All of these are experiences of fear, fear-based parts of your personality, and they are not your obstacles to spiritual growth. They are your avenues to spiritual growth. They are the parts of your personality 
that your soul contributed to your personality prior to its incarnation, not its incarnation, an aspect of your soul incarnated. And it gave to the incarnation parts that it itself wants, you could say to heal, but the soul doesn't heal, it evolves. These parts of your personality, the frightened parts, the destructive parts, the painful parts, are exactly those parts that keep you from giving the gifts that you were born to give. How can you give the gifts you were born to give when you can't stop thinking about sex, when you're enraged, when you feel worthless, when you can't get out of bed in the morning, or when you're covering over all of these feelings with manic excitement and obsessions and behaviors? You can't. So how do you move beyond them? Now, the loving parts, by the way, are those parts that are grateful, appreciative, caring, content, in awe of the universe, patient. And creating authentic power is developing the ability to distinguish these different parts of your personality and yourself, which is identical with saying, developing the ability to distinguish love from fear in yourself and choosing love all the time. No matter what's happening in you, whether it's sexual craving, craving for food, anger, rage, superiority, or what's, or what's happening outside of you, like another 9-11 type event. The frightened parts of your personality show you these aspects of yourself that you need to move beyond the control of. And they don't show you in a gentle or subtle way. They're painful. They hurt. As you learn how to experience these parts of any part of your personality deeply, you'll find that the frightened parts hurt physically, physically, physically painful sensations occur in different parts of your body. Heartache is not poetic. Heartache is real. It is real. Just like jealousy is real. So you learn how to distinguish them using your body. Emotional awareness somatically. Your body will not lie to you. When you put your attention in certain parts of your body, if you find painful physical sensations there, you'll know that fear is present in you. And that's a good thing to know because I suggest you consider the possibility that whenever you act in fear, you create painful consequences for yourself. That means that when you feel a fear-based part of your personality with all its magnetic attraction, when you are angry, when I'm angry, when a frightened part of me or you, your personality is angry, it is righteous. It feels justified. It doesn't matter if it lashed out at someone. It feels that someone deserved it. And you're going to tell them why. And to not act on that requires your volition your free will. And until you can fully feel what you're challenging, you won't know what you're challenging. When you fully feel it, you'll know how painful it is and how attractive it is, how magnetic it is, and how hard it is not to act on it. Probably many of the people who are watching us have experienced an addiction or are experiencing one and maybe don't understand it yet. I know when I was addicted, uh, it was when I became engaged with somebody and she saw how my attention would fly out at me to another woman. Even though I wouldn't say anything, she could feel it. She was highly intuitive. 
And she said, but I'll talk about my former addiction later if we come back to it. Right now I want to know, are there any, are there any other questions that you want to ask me? Well, there are many, there are many um, aspects of life that you, you point to and um, illustrate the difference between this old consciousness or the five sensory perception or uh, five sensory human versus multi-sensory human. You make it clear that it's not one is better than the other or one is good, one is bad. It's simply an outmoded consciousness and outmoded way of living as human beings one of the ones that really one of Can the I? aspects that yes uh, first of all yes it's just outmoded um, external power is obsolete a candles candle power didn't make didn't become up candle power didn't become destructive with the advent of electricity it just wasn't needed anymore it, was, it, it wasn't helpful. Well, the old consciousness is destructive, but it's not worse. It's not better. The universe doesn't look at our experience as better and worse. It looks at it in terms of cause and effect. Wherever there is a, a cause, there is an effect. The effect may seem to come later, but it comes into being at the moment that the cause is chosen. Your intention of love or your intention of fear is the cause. But whatever the intention, the cause creates an effect and you are part of the effect. So we can't say that pursuing external power. We can say it, but the universe doesn't look at pursuing external power as bad it sees it as a cause and you will experience the effect when you choose that cause. So if you look at your life that way, you'll see that you won't need to judge yourself, although frightened parts of your personality will continue for a while as bad or good, superior or inferior. You look at your experiences and say, let me consider the possibility that I created this. How did I create it if I did? And how can I avoid creating this in the future? Or if it's a, an experience of loving connection and fulfillment and gratification, say, how did I experience this? How did I create this? And how can I do it again? These are the things that you become capable of as you begin to recognize and appreciate your multisensory perception and its new potential of authentic power. So th th there was another part to your question also, Ross. The there was. Thank you for, for illuminating that part. The other, the part I was curious, because I know the Banyan community, um, many people probably listening today have been reading your books for a long time and are, are on the path in some way, the spiritual path. One thing that was very interesting and I think will interest our community is how the old mode of consciousness played out on the spiritual path and in religious structures, as well as the difference that you speak about in um, the old way of prayer versus what you're calling multi-sensory prayer. Oh, that's one of the many things that changes, has changed with the new consciousness. Everything religion, like you're talking about, relationship, power, art, temptation, all of these things are different as you see them from the impersonal perspective of your soul, which is multi-sensory perception. So the big difference that you're asking about is that Multi-sensory perception allows us to experience things that we previously had to believe. We had to take on faith. We had to believe in using our faith to do it. And we can see the difference 
between love and fear, even as we look at religions. Well, um, everyone knows about the horrendous Hindu-Muslim riots that ripped India apart, even after Gandhi's loving, heroic, life-changing, world-changing example of Ahimsa and Satyagraha. Still, India divided into Muslim and Hindu countries. India, Hindu, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, Muslim. How could that happen? How could it happen when Krishna specifically said to all Hindus, your being, the self in you, is immortal and indestructible? How could they have wasted their time venting their rage, their fear on one another? How could Christians have killed so mercilessly through millennia, the two millennia of their existence? The Holy Roman Inquisition, for example, put quotes around holy, except in the profound sense that everything is holy. The difference is that well, this is my experience. Every religious organization or religion has at its core a universal truth. Universal means it applies to everyone. It's not a relative truth that only applies to you. For example, the universal truth at the core of Christianity is love. Every religious organization or religion forms as an incrustation around a kernel of universal truth. Just like a grain of sand irritates an oyster and it forms an incrustation around that irritation. The universal human truth of love that the Christ implanted in the five sensory species, and specifically the five sensory culture, when he walked the earth, was love. And not just sentimental love. That is not love. That is need. But love with all its boldness, with all its implacability. He said, love your neighbor well enough to die for your neighbor. Not in those specific words, but his entire life painted that picture and that message. What would the world be like if every Christian loved you well enough to die for you, loved you that much? Christians think that love is a good idea. Many Christians believe that it's worth committing their lives to. But very few of them live it the way the Christ lived it. And yet the Christ was very clear. Everything I've done, everything I've done, he was unequivocal. You can do and more. And yet, through the millennia, two of them, Christians have murdered in the name of Christ, in the name of love, in the name of all that's good and holy. And this is very confusing. Not only to believers, but to religious professionals as well. Because they do not want to give up the universal truth at the core of Christianity. And so that's their proverbial baby. And they keep their proverbial bathwater because they will not throw out the baby. The proverbial bathwater is the incrustation, the religious institution. Now, this is not just so for Christianity. I only speak of that because I was born in a Christian country. 
and I'm not Christian, but by osmosis, I've been exposed to it all, its, all my life, its values. And I see the value that it gives to so many people. And I also this, see this irreconcilable incongruity between the violence that has always been part of the church. Not only the, the Holy Roman Inquisition, the Crusades. Let's look at Buddhism the kernel of universal truth that the Buddha that the Buddha put into the five sensory culture in which he was born was enlightenment perception far beyond the five senses the ability to see the nature of the universe our own original face to see worlds each as, as, as numerous as motes of dust, that's a quote, each with its own paths to enlightenment and Buddhas. And a sun, a, an, an awareness, a perception brighter than 10,000 suns. That is the universal truth embedded at the core of Buddhism. But that is not Buddhism. Religions, no matter what they are, are pursue external power. They compete for believers. Within the religion, they can be, compete for congregants. They compete in providing the best idea, the inside track. And yet, whether Buddhism has been a, a path for you or Christianity or Hinduism or Islam, there exists this distinction and everyone knows it. Now that we're five multi-sensory, we can see what it is. We can see fear and the forms that it takes and we can choose to challenge fear and to cultivate love. Did that help with your question? Absolutely. I wasn't going to go there this evening, but all of this is in the book. All of this is in Universal Human. Yes. And as I say, it's a way of looking at, at the world, but it's a very compassionate, uh, fulfilling, gratifying, uh, healthy, sane, in my experience, way of looking at the world. It is looking at the world without judgment. Uh, that doesn't mean without discernment. Judgment is discernment, but it's got an emotional charge to it of right and wrong. If you see an abuser abusing someone, it's appropriate that you do what you can to prevent that from happening. Gandhi would step in between the two. His rationale was the abuser will vent his rage, his anger, his fear on me and leave the other one unharmed. But if you judge the abuser, then you create negative consequences for yourself. Universal human will help you to be practical. And in being practical in your love, real love, not the kind of love that has to do with heart-shaped candy boxes and cupids and ribbons, but the real love, the love that you come from and that you are, that the Earth School is, that the universe is, this book will help you touch that cultivate that, but first you have to recognize that. And you can now. Hundreds of millions of us are becoming multi-sensory. And I, some of them are listening to us right now. <laughs> absolutely. 
You know, I just want to remind our audience quickly that we're about to start going into some of the questions from the audience. And anybody who's not aware, you can type your questions for Gary Zukov into the Q&A tab. And we'll get to as many of those as we can. And before we started, Gary encouraged us to welcome questions of a personal nature for people as well. So don't, don't be shy about asking specific questions. Before we go into that, Gary, something you just said about the real love and something you said just before we went live about caretaking, and that's not love. This seems like such an important point for us to understand and embody that love doesn't always look like saying yes to things. It doesn't always look like being a doormat. And I think a lot of the time we can misinterpret what love really means. Can you speak to that? Oh, yes. Yes. Caretaking or overcare or however you look at it does not come from love. Caretaking is attempting to make someone else feel better so that you'll feel better yourself. If they're in pain, you want to relieve their pain. It's not them. What you're doing, what a frightened part of your personality is doing, it is doing with the expectation of recognition or appreciation or thanks, or at least not dismissal. If you take your time to find a nice gift for someone that's in the hospital, you think it'll be just the right gift and you give it. And then they open the gift and they just drop it on the floor off their hospital bed and they say, I never wanted one of those. And it's not my favorite color anyway. Don't you know that? Well, if you have any reaction to that, then that'll be because you had a second agenda in the gift. Caretaking has second agendas. Caregiving is without agenda. That comes from the heart. The heart has no second agendas. It's only agenda is what it is. And it is love. As you read and put into practice what is in universal human, it will support you, as I've said several times, but specifically it will support you in evolving spiritually. It will do that because that is now required for our evolution. Five sensory humanity evolved by surviving, and it survived by pursuing external power the ability to manipulate and control. Multi-sensory humanity, we, hundreds of millions of us now, and soon, within a few generations, all of us, evolve by growing spiritually. And we grow spiritually by creating authentic power. How to do that is a large part, not the only part, a part that's very practical in universal human. I've mentioned a couple of the tools, the major tools, emotional awareness and responsible choice. That means the conscious use of your free will to choose an intention of love. A responsible choice is a choice that creates consequences for which you are willing to assume responsibility. And it's good that you can see in those terms if you're willing to because you are responsible for your choices and you will experience to what extent you are responsible. That's karma, but we'll talk about that maybe later or in one of the questions. So there was something else that you just asked me, Ross, and, and what is it, Vienda? It was, it was, I think you answered the question really. It was about caretaking and, and the distinguishing or discerning authentic love from uh, maybe our misconceptions about love. And I yeah, think that there isn't a, a, a authentic love is redundant, but I understand um, love is authenticity, but I, I'm, but someone can say, yeah, well, I'm authentically angry here. Think about that. Um, love is love. Fear is fear. One precludes the other. They are mutually exclusive. Everything in the Earth School 
is structured in terms of duality. Good, bad, light, dark, big, small. Fast, slow. But the fundamental duality in the earth school is love and fear. The opposite of love is not hatred, it's fear. And the intention underlying all other intentions comes down bedrock to one of those. An intention is a quality of consciousness that infuses your actions or your words. In other words, it's not your actions or your words that create the consequences for you, that create your karma. It's your intention. And you can feel this in people if you're looking for it. You've met people that appear to be kind or friendly or polished or smooth. And you sense below that something not to trust. And you've met other people who are gruff, even harsh. But underneath that, you can sense a kind heart. Well, there's ways that you don't have to depend on your ability to sense these things. When you create authentic power, you're not, you withdraw your concern to change the world which is now toxic, counterproductive to our evolution. And instead, turn your attention inward to change yourself. You begin to look at dynamics inside you. And as you do, you begin to see that the emotional pain that you feel is not caused by anything that happens in the external world. Five sensory humans, they say, what? Are you talking to me? What world are you living in? I'm living in this one. A multi-sensory perception of the world we've always been in. But it reveals new aspects of our reality in that world. The external world, all of your interactions, all of your experiences, activate these internal dynamics within you that we have been calling fear-based and love-based parts of your personality. And those internal dynamics create your painful or blissful experiences. And all of this, by the way, as you read Universal Human, you'll see there's ways to experiment with this. You don't have to just believe this. It reads well, I think, because, I lo because these things are the way you can see for yourself, experience is structured. The bare bone structure of self-transformation is the same no matter how you dress it. You cannot change something about yourself that you don't know exists. And when you discover that it exists, you cannot change it if you do not intend to change it. This is emotional awareness and responsible choice. And when you change it with your willpower, you create authentic power. In the moment, while you're experiencing the painful physical sensations of a frightened part of your personality, you reach for, you try to remember the healthiest, most loving, which means most sane, grounded, constructive part of your personality that you can. And even if you can't reach it, try to remember a time when you were feeling content or that you knew the world was good in some way, or you were with someone, maybe it was a grandparent, and, a, and you knew that you were loved, and you knew there was no second agenda. Reach for that while you're feeling the magnetic attraction of fear or rage or jealousy or judgment. Because where your attention goes, you go. And as you even turn toward a loving part of your personality. You turn toward love. Universal humans emerge out of authentically powerful humans. So creating authentic power is not a shortcut to the universal human. It's a requirement. 
universal humanity emerges out of a multi-sensory, authentically empowered humanity. But there are emerging universal humans in the world. I've written about some of them in Universal Human, so you can see for yourself what they're like. Oh, there's so many, there's so many. Uh, we have a friend, Linda and I met. Uh, his name is Nipun Meta. Nipun uh, graduated from UC Berkeley, uh, was immediately snatched up by uh, Silicon Valley. I think he worked for Sun Microsys Microsystems for a while. But that wasn't where he wanted to go, even though there was a lot of money in that for a brilliant entrepreneur and programmer. And so he and some friends from Berkeley uh, decided they wanted to support people. And he asked his folks uh, if they could invite people over to the house once a week for an hour of uh, sitting together, for an, an hour of meditating silently, then an hour of discussing a passage, which the people could, could suggest passages in advance, not scripture necessarily, just any passage that felt wise and compassionate, and then spend an hour in silence eating together. No donation box, nothing to give, nothing to belong to, <laughs> as Nipun put it. That gathering, th these gatherings now take place around the world in different apartments and homes in different countries and continents. They're called awakened circles. Today, they're called awakened circles. Today, there are 600,000 volunteers in an organization that Nipun and his colleagues created called Service Space. You can visit them, servicespace.org. They've got lots of websites, The Daily Good, Daily Kindness, Karma Tube. Here's another one of their uh, programs. Uh, we went to a restaurant once and it was a very different kind of restaurant. Imagine going into a restaurant and you order a beautiful meal. It's healthy, very good. It's vegan, very good. It's fresh, absolutely. And then when it's done, you say, would you bring me my bill? And the server says, there is no bill. And you say, well, well, how do you get paid? And he says, I'm a volunteer. And then the, ser and, and, and then the customer finally says, well, I, I wanna pay for something. And the server says, uh, why don't you pay for them? And he points to a table over there for their meal. That's, these restaurants are called karma kitchens. And they're also a service space initiative. Not that they're actual brick and mortar buildings. They rent a restaurant for a night the way you or I would rent a restaurant for a birthday. But they turn it into a karma kitchen for that night so people can experience the wonderful feeling of generosity and kindness and paying it forward. So I put Nipun in Universal Human as an example of an emerging universal human. A universal human is authentically powerful beyond culture, beyond religion, nation, ethnic group, gender. A human whose allegiance is to life first and all else second. Nipun is an emerging universal human. And there's more examples in the book, Universal Human. In fact, the book is dedicated to emerging universal humans. And I say directly to you, Ross, and to all of the people that are listening to us and watching us, you might be one. 
So look at these characteristics of a universal human. Look inside yourself at them, and you may find those in you. Wonderful. Before we get into our audience questions, I want to just ask, what are you and your wonderful spiritual partner, Linda Francis, up to next? What's, what's happening going forward with you? A lot. <laughs> I've been reclusive. By the way, beloved, if you're listening, uh, please come over and join us. This would be a lovely time for you to do that. Yes, please. Um, we are creating, well, first of all, Universal Human, as you mentioned, is being published on June 22nd. And in preparation and integration with that event, we are creating, we are creating a new website, brand new online courses, brand new social media, um, and a podcast called Universal Human. And all of that uh, we have been envisioning and meditating on for several years. But in the last couple of years, we've actually started to talk to teams to help us put it together. And now it's coming to conclusion. It's a lot, so we don't know if it's all going to come to conclusion on June 22nd. Mm -hmm. But we do know that you will be able to see a very different, a very different website uh, in about a month. So our website is seatofthesoul.com. Oh, here's here's my spiritual partner. Would you join us? Hey. Hello, Linda. Hello, welcome. Us. Hi, beloved. Hi, beloved. And hello, everyone. Thanks for coming in. <laughs> so glad you came to join us, Linda. So good to be here. Yeah. So Ross has just asked uh, what we've been up to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's so interesting because the pandemic, I don't know what you said because I was, I heard you invite me over and then I came over so I didn't hear everything you said. But anyway, um, I was thinking about um, the pandemic really speeded us up in a way because we wanted to do everything online, live online, so we could include many more people in the world. And um, this really speeded us up because we were doing mostly physical events. We were at that yeah, time. Yeah, mostly. Yeah, we'd have some some. Um, in fact, they were all Zoom. physical events. So. Well, so, yeah, yeah. We, so. I mean, we had some calls and things like that that were not true. But but um, we have been experimenting this whole year with live online events, and it's been so wonderful uh, to see how powerful they are and how wonderful they are. And so we're creating a number of them. For, um, there's one that we're doing in July that's a live online event. It's a five-day event called Journey to the Soul. And that will include, you know, just how how you, um, how multisensory humans become authentically empowered. And of course, it's not going to happen in five days. But we get practice together and we work together and we uh, learn how to be spiritual partners with each other, which is a partnership between equals for the purpose of spiritual growth, which is what Gary and I started our relationship out that way. Uh, I had read The Seed of the Soul, and basically the universe connected us. And, and because Linda and I are spiritual partners, please don't uh, think that spiritual partnership is a dyadic relationship, mm -hmm. or, or it's a, it, it's a two-person relationship. Or it's just couples, three, it's not. Or, or it's just mm -hmm. couples. It can be you and your biological family. That's wonderful when that happens. It's difficult. Uh, spiritual partnership is difficult because, and rewarding, because the partners are committed to their spiritual development. That means to their emotional awareness and to making loving, responsible choices. And that's a challenge. And, 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 and we what, help what, each what other. The point is, your athletic team, your class. Yeah, everyone. Uh, everyone at Banyan Books on the staff. And I feel, from what I sense about Banyan Books, many people who are simply customers and have been for a long time are part of a spiritual partnership, a partnership between equals for the purpose of spiritual growth. And yes. reading Universal Human will put some meat on that so you'll understand 
how it works. Mm, indeed. So thanks, indeed. beloved. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we so we've been so much enjoying doing these online events, uh, live online events. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, we would love to do physical events sometime in the future, but I, I always and we always want to not exclude anyone, you know, that really is interested in growing. So we're so excited about the possibility now of being able to support so many people. And we want to give everything that we know about what we've been learning about authentic power and spiritual partnership and emerging universal human, becoming an emerging universal human. We want to share that with everyone, not not, I mean, now and in the future, even if Gary and I are no longer here, we want to leave behind what we've been learning um, in a way that can be most supportive to people. So we are uh, really so, uh, so dedicated, so uh, committed to that, and so, so excited about what we're um, now creating with other people to support people. They can come, you know, they can come to our website theatreofthesoul.com. Now it's not, it's old. It's, it's old. But, uh, but they'll get an, a sense maybe of us. The primary difference in all of this is engagement. We want to engage. If you have questions, we want to hear them. We want to support you. Why do we have events at all, since all of this is in the books that we've written, for practice, to put it into your life, to bring it into being, to experiment with it. And that's what we invite you to do. Mm -hmm. As you learn about authentic power, uh, don't be cynical, but be skeptical. Think, can this work? I'm going to try that myself and see. And we tell you specifically, to the best of your ability, see if you can jump up and down on it, bend it, twist it, break it. You can't. And it's not creating authentic power that you're learning to do to change it's, or to make, it's your life that you're experimenting with. And that's what you have it for. And that's what our events are for. And that's what the entire ecosystem that we put together is for. Because Linda and I are in the final stages of our life in the Earth School. And we want to provide a source mm. of experience and clarity about authentic power, spiritual partnership, and the universal human. So that now and in the future, people who are interested can come to it. And it'll only be about that. It won't be about inner child or shadow work or any of the other uh, uh, helpful modalities that are available. But just about authentic power, spiritual partnership, and the universal human. Then, once people understand, you understand, or whoever visits understands that to their satisfaction... Take it with you everywhere. Then is the time to share it. Mix it up. See how it flows in your life. Bring it into parenting or education or health care or jurisprudence or even the military. Well, you know, that's one thing. I don't think you – I'm not sure. I don't think you talked about this, but part of the universal book, The Universal Human, is about how all of our social structures are disintegrating because they're based on external power. But when uh, and and so it's it's positive, it's not negative that this is happening. But I I know that people creating authentic power and being in spiritual partnerships with each other are going to co-create what's new, and they already are. They may not even know the words authentic power. They may not know the words spiritual partnership, but they. They are co-creating with love things that have never been created. They're opening to their intuition. They're doing things in the world that are so amazing. And um, we, we just um, are so excited to be of support to that in any way we can. Wonderful. It's all very exciting. And thank you for, for sharing all of this with us. And I'm sure a lot of people in the community will be checking that out, seatofthesoul.com. Now, we have had a lot of audience questions come in and we're already over time. This was scheduled for an hour, but Gary said to me at the beginning, he if it was flowing in that direction and, and we needed to go a bit over, he was willing. So just letting our audience know, if you do have to leave, don't worry. As usual, the podcast gets posted uh, to our U Banyan Books YouTube page, as well as all the podcasting platforms, Apple Music, 
Google Music, uh, Spotify, and anywhere you can find podcasts. So just look for Banyan Books mm -hmm. in conversation and you'll be able to find this podcast. Mm -hmm. Okay, if we can get to a few of the audience questions. Um, the first one it comes from an anonymous person in the audience. Uh, asking, would you be willing to speak on grief? I lost a son and grandson <clears throat> within three months. I have been told I created that experience. How do I deal with the shame and guilt? Mm. Because you are watching this event, you are multi-sensory. Draw upon that. As you begin to move into your multi-sensory perception, you begin to see that a life on the earth is not the way it appears to a five-sensory human. A five-sensory human thinks that a life on the earth begins on your birthday and ends on your death day. A multi-sensory human sees that a birth is the voluntary incarnation of an immortal soul into physicality, into the domain of time and space and matter and duality for the purpose of learning in that domain, learning to grow spiritually. Spiritual means having to do with your soul. And as you grow spiritually, as you challenge the parts of your personality that are painful and destructive, you contribute directly to the evolution of your soul. At the end of your time in the earth school, you experience the return home of your soul. That means your personality dies. This is taken to be a catastrophe by five sensory humans, the end of all that is. Even if you're a believer and you believe in reincarnation and you believe in heaven and you've done your best to get there, still, it's a blow and I also to a five sensory perception. Five sensory perception, meaning that from a higher place in me, I do um, see things differently, but there are fear-based parts of my personality that feel devastated, would feel devastated about that. Yes, that's, that's just where we were going. Yeah. So what you're experiencing are frightened parts of your personality. And someone who said you created that is not someone who's understanding karma exactly, perhaps. All of your experiences are karmic necessities, but all of your experiences and that means without exception, are gifts from a gracious universe. Everything that you experience in the Earth School is directed toward one goal, which is to bring the consciousness of your soul into the awareness of your personality and use it. The experiences that are given to us, are given to you, are not always experiences that the personality would choose. But they are powerful. As you look at the world from the impersonal perspective of your soul, you will look at... <clears throat> the return home of the soul that in, a part of which incarnated as your son and a part of which incarnated as your grandchild. And you will look instead of a loss that's irreplaceable, which is the perception of fear. You will look at the gifts that you were given by these two souls and the power of them. Look at what your grandchild brought to you in the span of its life in the earth school and your son 
Not all of those experiences were easy. But all of them, but none of them were random. All of them were given to you to assist you in your spiritual development. And as you look at your experiences, even these that are as difficult or challenging or unfathomable from a five sensory perspective, know that there is a larger perspective that is a part or becoming a part of your consciousness now in which the primary orientation is love. That means gratitude. That means appreciation. That means awe of the universe. And you will see eventually how awesome these experiences are. When a soul uh, returns home to physical reality, we all feel it. It's in that moment or in those moments that the bigness of the soul that was in the earth school is evident to us in our experience. Mm -hmm. The whole is big. But the soul did not go anywhere. There is no elsewhere. There are so many things that multisensory perception brings to you. So even while the frightened parts of your personality are grieving, are sorrowful, are in pain, allow yourself to begin to open to other possibilities. The Buddhists have a saying that puzzled me for decades. It was, it is, the river of suffering is deep and wide. A turn of the head is the other side. You experience the events of your life your experience of the events of your life are determined by how you hold them. Multisensory perception allows you to hold them very differently than five sensory humans are able. Mm -hmm. And therefore, multisensory humans can evolve much more quickly and learn much more deeply and fully and satisfactorily and satisfyingly from their experience, even those that a five sensory human can barely bear to look at. I hope this has been helpful to you. Oh, yeah. part, part. I was thinking, beloved, that um, we, we, when we met we met a friend of ours who we didn't know at the time. And when we met mm -hmm. him, he had lost his uh, three-year-old daughter and his wife before we'd mm -hmm. even met him. And he had two uh, boys, young boys. And we met him uh, because um, he came on one of the early Oprah shows that Gary did with Oprah. And uh, he was... Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> multi-sensory, he really saw that this was something that he could learn from, that even all in all the pain, he knew he was to learn things about uh, about his life, about why why this happened. And uh, it was just so powerful and so beautiful how he uh, handled yeah. everything. And um, and then later on, a few years later, he lost one of his sons. So it seems unimaginable. If you hear a story like that, I know for you it might, it seems unimaginable that this could happen. Uh, but it does happen, and you know it because you're feeling the pain of it. However, what I saw in, in our friend Tom is that he used this experience to grow and learn about himself, and not only that, but to support other people in their grief and the things that were going on with them. It's really uh, quite remarkable. He It became his gift to give, and uh, it was is to support a, people. And it is a beautiful gift. Now, his name is Tom Zuba. Tom Zuba. Zuba. 
Z U B A. You can look it up. And I'm sure that Banyan carries his book. I probably permission to grieve or something like that. It's been a long time since I read it, but it's powerful. And Tom knows about grief, just like you know about grief. Yes, he does. So um, he has things to share that are so helpful. They allow you to see from a larger perspective your experiences and how you can gain from them no matter what they are, no matter what they are. So I hope that this talk has been helpful to you, and, and I'm so grateful to you for asking your question. Yes. And I hope that Tom's book will be a comfort to you. And also, Actually, it's not the book that's the comfort. You provide your comfort as you begin to shift your perception. Right. And also, the seat of the soul is very comforting to Tom. That's why we <laughs> yeah, met him. Yeah, that's why we were together. <laughs> that's why we met him, uh, because it was so supportive to him to be able to see his life that way and to be able to begin to make sense of the things that were happening that he didn't understand at the time, but, but began to see more clearly from a multi-sensory point of view. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you both. I think we have time, if it's okay with you, for one more question. It's fine, it, 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 it's fine with us. We have time for more than one if you want. But. Okay, fantastic. Um, so this one's from Kathy. And Kathy says, so lovely to start my Sunday morning with you, Gary. And Linda, of course, this was before Linda joined that she would have written this question. What is the place of career ambition in a multi-sensory world? What we've been sharing with you is, is not judgmental. Um, uh, ambition is usually a word that's taken to mean um, something coming from a frightened part of your personality, but it doesn't have to be. Everything is a matter of intention. Intention is primary. If what your desire and your heart's desire is to have a career, for example, in social work or in finance or in, well, let's say social, social work or medicine or teaching, then ambition serves your passion. If your ambition is to make a lot of money in your career, then look at whether that comes from love or not. And you can do that by saying, in this case, I want to have a successful career. Why? Because I want to make more money. Why do you want to make more money? Now you can begin to explore. Well, because my child is ill and my mother is ill and she doesn't have Medicare or insurance. Now, uh, eventually you come to a bedrock intention and it's love or it's fear. If it's love, that's not better. If it's fear, that's not worse. Love and fear are different. They're opposites. They are each causes and they each create effects. So now back to your question. Where does career ambition enter the picture? Uh, it depends on your intention for having a career. <clears throat> as you align your personality with your soul, use meaning as your compass. Mm. When you are moving in the direction that your soul wants to give, wants to go, which is what I've been calling gifts that you were born to give, your life begins to fill with meaning. And after a while, you can't imagine doing anything else. That's my experience now. There's so many things that would be fun. Actually not. There's nothing I would rather do than what I'm doing now. <laughs> nothing. Sometimes we take a break, but usually we go to give events when we take a break. And it's not because we're obsessed, it's because there's so much joy in it. Uh, so look at what your ambition is, look at what your intention is, because rem remember an intention is a quality of consciousness that infuses your words or your deeds. And you will bring that quality of consciousness into whatever you do, whether it's a career or a family or a class or a ball game,
what is your intention? That is where career ambition uh, enters the picture. And, and we can answer that in that way, but how to know what your intention is isn't so easy to be able to discover. And so that's exactly what we teach about. How do you create authentic power? So if you want to really explore that, you may want to come to our Journey to the Soul event this summer, five-day Journey to the Soul. It's something that we will really explore what it means to create uh, what, what your intention is underneath whatever you're planning to do. We'll share with you how you create um, uh, authentic power, how you become emotionally aware, how you discover how your choices and what those choices are. Are they coming from love or fear before you make them? So that and, and people to, sh to share and practice with will be there. Also. Uh, I, I want to return to something to something I, I took a, I put aside for the moment when we started to talk when I said let's look at how ambition and career are usually thought of by five sensory humans and it has to do with self-service but our social structures as Linda mentioned are all in the process of being replaced they're disintegrating they can't be fixed they're obsolete that's why they're falling down but what if your career is in business? What if your career is in finance? Does that mean that your uh, ambition is motivated by greed? No, depends upon your intention. There is a shift happening, a groundswell in commerce, in business. Mm -hmm. For example, you can participate in the evolution of business if that is your intention, without your primary intention being able to maximize benefit for yourself. And in fact, that is where business is going. You'll see in Universal Human a little history of commerce from Adam Smith forward. But, so, so where but is the I, history you know, of business going? It's going to service. Oh. It's going to love. <laughs> okay. A new intention of business is beginning to make itself visible. Mm. And the newest intention of business that is emerging is the, pot is the potential of business as pure service, which is the ultimate and eventual replacement of the oldest intention of business, which is pure profit. And you can see this shift before your eyes. Um, before, investments were made purely for return on investment, and there was no loyalty to the investee. There was only benefit for the investor. Now, in the last two decades, there has emerged the entire area of socially responsible investing, which means investors are saying, I will no longer put our money, my money, into a company that is damaging the environment, a company that is damaging employees, a, da a company that is doing things that are not constructive. And even more than that, in the last 10 years, a new form of investing called impact investing has emerged. And that is not only do not criteria that say do not, but criteria that say do. Do benefit your host community. Do benefit your employees. Do benefit your customers. These things for socially responsible investing um, impact investing, B Corp. If you don't know what a B Corp is, it's a corporation whose shareholders and board demand not that it make quarterly profits, but that it, it her, adhere to its beneficent intention. Its articles include benefit to life, benefit to the world, benefit to society. All of this is an indication that you can have a career in finance 
and still have the intention and have the intention to contribute to the movement of this entire realm of human activity. Mm. So I hope that's helpful as you contemplate your, your choices. Indeed. That's fantastic. And I, I can also reiterate that there's much more on this in, in the book, Universal Human, and I encourage everyone to, to get a copy and read it. A question from Helen. She says, I am a do not beat around the bush type of personality and often come across harsh, but do not mean to be. I am full of love and very open to everyone. How people receive me differently, but mostly see me, I think she means, however, people receive me differently, but mostly see me as unkind. When I try to come across kind and nice, I feel like I am pretending. Yes, if you're coming across nice, you probably are. And that's why it feels artificial. I'm not a beat around the person, <laughs> around the bush person either. There's not enough time now. And the a beating bushes is not a satisfying, <laughs> a satisfying activity. Love is all there is. Eventually, you will come to understand that. Love heals everything, and love is all there is. Now, how can you bring that into your life? How can I do it when I become angry, when frightened parts of my personality become active that are angry? Well, one of the things is I can look at myself and assess myself, not in terms of my low water marks, but my high water marks. Mm -hmm. So if you're a, since you're a person that uh, doesn't prevaricate, that says things directly, say things directly, but before you do, ask yourself, what is my intention? Mm -hmm. Before you speak, before you act, ask yourself, what is my intention? And do not act or speak until you feel that you know the answer. When you ask that question, you will not be alone in your answer. You may have to take a break, you may have to go into town, you may have to walk by a stream to rest yourself, but the answer will come and you will know that it's either coming from a loving part of your personality or a frightened part of your personality. Try that. Try that and see how that affects you. And Ross, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just remembering that we're coming close to another call that we have to make. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I, I've just so much enjoyed being being with all of you. It's a, it's a pleasure. Maybe when Linda and I are in Vancouver again, yeah. we'll come and see it. And if, and if you're in the sunshine and you're <laughs> on, on your coast, yes. you'll come and see us there. Yes. And the same for same for Jacob and everyone else who's been involved here. So love to all of you and 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 love to Banyan Books. Oh yes indeed. So good to join all of you today. I'm really so so excited to be here with all of you. Thank you. Wow, what a what a special treat to have Gary Zukov and Linda Francis. Thank you for joining us for the second portion as well. Uh, a really special occasion for us at the Banyan community. And uh, thank you so much. And of course, a big shout out to Jacob, our events coordinator and the producer of the Banyan Books in Conversation podcast for all the amazing work he does to put these events mm -hmm. together for everybody. Again, thank you very much for being with us today and sharing all of your wisdom. It's a pleasure, Ross. So good to be with Goodbye, you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Love you deep. <laughs>